Okay, so welcome back to science. Uh, this is tub number five we've discovered. The choices in here are, or the things that are in here are, um, a Ziploc bag, you had a piece of a cardboard box, um, this is felt, uh, bubble wrap, and um, this is like styrofoam or like um, it's like a squishy type of thing. What? How did you guys classify this for number five? Okay. Oh, they're all thin. I wouldn't have thought of that. That's a great idea. Thin? Any other ideas you guys came up with? Soft? Um, well, I... I mean, it's not necessarily soft, but it's not. This particular cardboard isn't as hard as it could be. Um, well, I don't know that I would call cardboard squishy. Um, yeah, you could use solid, but I like to be a little bit more creative than that, right? Solid. Um, Yep, they're all flammable. No, not all of it's flammable. Um, I was thinking they're all flexible or bendable. Right, because um, even the cardboard I can flex or bend it. This is, right? Right here. Oops, sorry, I can't see it. Right, 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 right. All right, let's look at the, you already had an opportunity. Uh, last one, which is number one. I'm going to cross these out. All right. Um, well, I did extras because I was just going to write the different ideas down, and then I decided to keep them all on the same line that you guys did yours, right? Uh, number one, what did you come up with for number one? We had um, a newspaper. Um, paper towel, computer paper, um, this is called tag board, in this case it's made of file, uh, construction paper, and this is, um, transparency, and you used to have, like, they were vis- I mean, there still are visa visa markers, and you used to write on them, and then um, you would write on them on a thing, and then it would project onto the screen. Used to be. Yeah, I mean, school appropriate, and then you could actually print on transparencies. It's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, but but the way this worked is you would write on it. And then there was a light that shone up, and then it would do some kind of magic is the way I would. And then it would go up, and then when we had the projectors, or a lot of times this was its own projector, you could project it out. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. With a visa visa, it dries on here, and then you would have to, like, Put water on it so most of the time when I would use it I would end up being like color coded at the end of the day not my finest so we, moment now I've also used transparencies to trace coloring pages with and then you can use a projector and project it on the wall and then you can trace the outline of it and then hey, yeah Except we don't, I don't know that we still have the technology to do it with. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, it's old tech, but I don't know if we still have that or not. Possibly, but it's not going to have the same effect. But anyways, how did you describe this?
Yeah, but what are they all like? What? And if I get the construction paper wet, it would bleed into something that's underneath it or whatever to make a huge mess. Definitely. Uh, I don't know that this is plastic, so I don't think we can call that wood. But I think the majority of it's made out of wood. The majority of it we could classify as what? Huh, huh. Paper, right? The majority of it you could classify as paper, right? Construction, paper, computer, paper. Um, I've printed on tag board and used this as heavy paper, right? We use construction paper for bulletin board, paper or paper type things. Um, I'm not making an airplane with them. Um, the other thing you could say is what? What other things could you say with that? They would all be flammable. Ah, they're all thin. Um, transparent means you can see through them. You can't see through all of them. So, where do we, where could we use all of these things? So, you could use them like school or office type stuff, right? Yeah, you could possibly use them for packaging. All right, we're going to shift. I'm going to shift forward, and then uh, after break, we'll shift back to catch. We've got one more classifying thing to do in this section, but we're going to shift forward a minute. We're going to do a, an article, and then we'll shift back. We do an article, then I have something plotted. Ha, 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 ha for right before spring break that would be kind of fun and then plotted plan well that was the plan was to do something kind of fun but i guess you'll have to wait and see won't you oh okay adventure on a hot air balloon the wind is starting to blow stronger and when you're riding in the basket under a hot air balloon just 400 feet above ground. That's not necessarily a good thing. Keith Rodriguez looks to the horizon and squints. He had planned to take off from um, so Soco Downs, a horse racetrack south of Columbus, Ohio, fly a few miles north, and land his balloon in a barren cornfield next to his pickup truck. Then the wind changed. Instead of a light breeze from the south, now Rodrigo's bright red balloon is getting hit by stronger, colder winds headed west. He has plenty of propane fuel. Um, so the wind changed. Instead of a light breeze from the south, now Rodrigo's bright red balloon is getting hit by stronger, colder winds headed west. He has plenty of propane fuel in his tank. He probably could ride the wind halfway to Pennsylvania. But that would be dangerous. Rodrigo's choice of landing sites just became very limited. As the balloon switches direction and floats east, everything below becomes a wide carpet of suburban sprawl, big box stores, major highways, and strip malls. Beyond the stores lie forests. So when you are a balloon, if you've ever set a balloon up, I'm not recommending this because balloons get into tractor or farmer fields, get tangled up in tractors and cause enormous damage, right? But let's pretend I had a balloon, I had a balloon on a string, it was tied tightly to Miss Richardson's wrist or whatever, right? And if I send it up, 
you can see which way the wind is going, right? And you can see how fast or how far or whatever it's doing. Well, that's what's going on with this. It's a big giant balloon. It's been released into the sky. He has a little bit of ways he can control it, but can you control a balloon very much with the string? No. So he's kind of at mercy of the weather. Um, the way it has him floating, it's taking him over like a Walmart, a Meyer, highways, expressways. Do you want to set a balloon down in someone's backyard? No, the, if you're in the city, you could be setting it down on a power line, phone lines, technology, you know, the whole nine yards, right? Is that a good plan or not a good plan? Not a good plan. Um, and then beyond that is forest. Can you set a balloon down on top of trees very easily? No, not without causing damage to yourself or... Well, exactly. The only factor in Rodriguez's favor is it's early. It's just after 7 a.m. The highways are filling up with people driving to work. But otherwise, the morning is quiet and still. So if you've ever gone to Walmart or Meyer at 7 in the morning, is it super full? It's pretty empty, right? So you could potentially put your balloon with your wicker basket down in a parking lot at Meyer or Walmart. But the biggest issue is you have phone lines, right? You have antennas. Um, and the light pole thing. So you have to be careful if you're setting it down there. It's smarter to set it down in the field, which was his original plan, right? Um, oh boy, Rodriguez thinks. Oh, that was one of the things that we were talking about today, right? What they think or using dialogue. And this is called dialogue. Oh boy, Rodriguez thinks. If I don't land, like now, this could get bad. The balloon has no propeller. So at the front of a plane is a propeller, right? That goes, spins around and around. It has no engine, so Rodriguez can't change the direction on his own. He's entirely dependent on the wind. Think of like a sailboat. Today, the sailboats probably have a backup engine in it. But the old-fashioned kind of sailboats did not, right? Back in Christopher Columbus days, that's why the pilgrims got thrown so far off course, right? <clears throat> um, the only thing he controls is altitude. Altitude means how high or how low you are. That's altitude, how high or how low you are. Um, he does this by changing the air temperature inside the balloon. This is really interesting. Sitting on the floor of the wicker gondola, gondola means the wicker basket, there are three tanks of liquid propane. Propane is what some people use to fuel their, their house. Do you have a big, it's usually those big white pig propane tanks in your yard? Raise your hand if you have a big white pig propane tank in your yard. Okay. Okay. Now, it says um, he has three, three tanks. They're not the huge ones. They're probably bigger than what you would use to go camping. Although my grandma has one on one of her campers that's like this big. Most of the propane tanks, when you get them filled, are about like this big, right? You go to like um, Ace Hardware Store or some places and you can refill your propane tanks for your gas grill, for your camper, for your that kind of thing. So he's got three of those. They're probably bigger than the little ones because the little ones only have like five. That's what I was thinking. It was five gallons. Thank you. Um. The tanks are connected via black rubber hoses to two burners overhead. So have you ever seen a hot air balloon? They get a fire inside it, right? They light a fire. The fire 
causes heat. And when you are in a house, if you're in a house, the heat goes up. So, so the blue, so because the heat gets warm, the balloon's going to go up. Now, if you are in a, so if you are in the summertime in your house, where's the coolest place in the summertime in the house? The basement. The basement's the coolest place. Whether or not you have air conditioner in your basement or not, the basement is the coolest place in the entire house, generally speaking. The second, the attic or the second story is, who it's hot. Ooh, it's hot. So my sister came to stay when they were putting her air conditioner in. And I took my thermometer. I have portable thermometers. I have one up there and I have a couple at home. I took my thermometer upstairs and I put it in the bedroom that she was staying in before the air conditioner was in. The temperature was over 100 degrees in the second floor of the house. Now, mind you, it had um, like almost floor to ceiling windows they weren't super wide but they're about this wide and they're almost floor to ceiling now they're not totally floor to ceiling but they're like a foot off this floor no they're not that wide they're this about this wide but there's two of them floor to ceiling and they face uh, they face west but so like we're on the east side, uh, like this is the east windows. We get a buttload of sun in there, right? We get a buttload of sun, which is why I've done all kinds of stuff trying to keep the heat out, right? Now, normally that side, so that's the side that, that those two rooms are in, but it's big windows, two big windows in that room. And, um, I think the reason that side stays so cool is because it's part of the U, right? In our building, it's part of the U. And so the other side of the building, the third grade wing, kind of blocks some of the light from coming in, right? Um, I don't think if that was there, I think it would. It might be a little bit warmer on that other side, but it's not. So um, that's Miss Richardson guessing. But um, so those rooms get really hot. Now, the other room has small windows in it, two small windows in it, and it's on the east side, but the east side also has huge, giant trees in it. So I have a bunch of trees on this side of my house, and on that side of my house, I don't have a ton of trees. So because there's not any trees, there's no shadows falling on the room, so you just get a bunch of sun beating in. So... Um, so Rodriguez turns a knob on one side of the burners. The, this releases, excuse me, this releases propane from a tank and it goes into the heating coil where the liquid propane is heated to a gas and it's mixed with air. Then the mixture is ignited by a pilot light. A pilot light is what tells the furnace to fire. So if your pilot, uh, pilot is out, your furnace doesn't burn. It could get really cold. Um, the mixture catches fire and flames leap up to two feet high into the balloon. Majority of you guys are probably close to five feet high, so it probably leaps about to your waist. That's pretty high flames, right? The balloon rises. Rodriguez has a plan in mind. The flame heats the air inside the nylon balloon. This works on a simple principle. Hot air is lighter than cold air. One cubic foot of air weighs about an ounce. So think about a foot by a foot by a foot. So if I had three rulers, if I made a box out of rulers, one cubic foot would be what's inside the rulers, right? says one cubic foot of air weighs about an ounce. There are 16 ounces in a pound. Okay. If you heat that air by 100 degrees Fahrenheit, its weight drops about 7 grams. 
This means that every cubic foot of heated air inside Rodriguez's balloon can lift about 7 grams. Just by himself, Rodriguez weighs 170 pounds, which equals about 77,110 grams. That means he needs about 11,016 cubic feet of hot air just to raise his own body off the ground. This is why hot air balloons are so big. They must trap tremendous amounts of heated air. Rodriguez's balloon is a common size. It traps about 100,000 cubic feet of air. The balloon is 80 feet high and 60 feet wide. Holy kazoos. As Rodriguez gives his short burst of flame, gives his short burst of flame, the air inside swirls in complicated, invisible patterns. Can we see the way the air is going? No, not unless you like spray a color into the air and you might like see it for a hot second, right? To drop in altitude, so to go down, Rodriguez can pull a cord attached to a parachute valve at the very top of the balloon. So the way top of the balloon is like a like a thing and if he pulls it it opens up like a square pops down opens up and it lets the hot air go out and the cool air comes in right or it goes out pretty quick um since the hottest air sits at the top this releases the balloon's most buoyant buoyant means lifting air which makes the balloon descend rodriguez gives the cord a short pull and the gondola drops a little I don't have an altim altimeter. Altimeter tells how high or low you are. And I can't really see anything happening inside the balloon. Rodriguez thinks, I have to pilot by feel. Okay. Pushed by the wind, the balloon is flying quicker now. It is floating over the back wall of a supermarket when Rodriguez grabs hold of the parachute valve cord and gives it a long, hard tug. The balloon drops quickly. The hot air balloon is sinking, but still flying forward. It looks as though it's about to slam into the edge of the supermarket's roof, but it sails over it with only about 15 feet to spare. Do you think the supermarket would be happy if you ran your balloon into the side of their... No. Um... Still, Rodriguez does not let go of the cord. He drops and drops right between light poles of the nearly empty parking lot. Just a few feet above the ground, Rodriguez releases the parachute cord, turns the knob above his head, and fires both burners. The steep descent slows. The gondola touches lightly against the asphalt and then drags to a stop. So he doesn't want to land like that, right? He wants to land like that. So what happens is, instead of keeping it going down really fast, when it gets about here, he fires up the burners, so it'll just kind of do this. Okay? Um, and then it drags to a stop. There are only two people in the parking lot standing near the entrance to the store. They look toward the balloon, their eyes and their mouths open wide and shut. What just happened here? That was a little closer than I expected, Rodriguez says to himself, laughing. I really need to land quick. I really needed to land quick. All right, so matter is everywhere. Is this the next page in your packet? I think so, right? Okay. Everything around us is made of matter. Your clothes, the trees, even the water you drink. We divide matter into four major categories, which we call the four states of matter. Liquid, gas, solid, and they're adding a fourth one. So we talked about liquid, solid, and gas, and now they're adding plasma. However, we will focus on the first three. Whatever the state of matter may be, all matter is made of tiny particles called atoms. These particles are too tiny to be seen with the naked eye, so with your just your eye or your glasses eye right um they're even too small to be seen with a regular microscope if you lined up a million atoms next to each other they will be as thick as a single piece of human hair 
So if you pull out a piece of hair, I'm not telling you to do that, but if you pull out a piece of hair, a million atoms are as thick as your one piece of hair. A million. So if I pull out a piece of hair, which I don't know if I can Let's see if I can pull out a piece of hair. Jasper was here. I could. Is his wow? Well, I do. I all right. Do I do I pull out Jasper's hair? No, but he's. Well, let's see if I can see it. I don't see it in here. Do you see it? I don't see it. All right. Let's, let's see. All right. Mine's super long. It is super long. All right, here's a long piece of hair. Here we go. I don't know. Can you see that? Let me. Let me hold it. All right. Ooh, that's. All right. So I have two pieces of hair there. Oh, we see them. So these two pieces of hair going across this piece of hair is a million atoms. Not the length going across. There's a million atoms there. Million. Like a million dollars? A million atoms. We're not talking about million dollars. But a million atoms are going across there. That's how small they are. Now, I have this visualizer basically as low as I can go so you can see them. Let me see if I can zoom in. So there's your hair and there's a million atoms that go across that single piece of hair. Isn't that crazy? Um, plasma is, uh, I'm done right now. Thank you, though. Plasma is, uh, um, your blood has plasma in it? No, that's, um, lava when it's out of the ground or, um, I don't know. I just lost it. All right. Um. So it says, so we can only look at atoms through very powerful tools. One of them is being the scanning tunnel microscope. So I zoomed in. That is not the same as a microscope. How do we know? We can easily see liquids and solids around us, but gases aren't visible. We can't see the air around us, but it is still made of atoms that constantly move around freely in space. How can we tell? Take a balloon, for example. When we pump air into a balloon, it visibly inflates. Have you ever blown a balloon and it gets bigger, right? That means gaseous matter is filling the balloon and taking up space. So the more air we blow into the balloon, the bigger it gets. Therefore, we can observe that the way the gas moves around space. In the same way, an inflatable pool toys also fill with air. So they can float on water. So have you ever seen, have you filled a balloon before or a floaty before? And what does it do? It floats on top of the water. The only problem with that is when the wind comes up, what happens with the floaties? Boosh! They act like an air, they act like a hot air balloon. Woo! There they go. When we fill the plastic shells with air, the toys take shape. Since air is less dense than water, the pool toys can rest on the water without sinking. And then we can enjoy a sunny day while floating in the pool. Or we can make sure the little people in our lives don't fall to the bottom of the pool, right? Because we put little floaties on their their arms, or right? Or we put them in a little tube and we strap them in so they're not going to go glug, glug, glug. They're going to go woo, right? Woo! Have you seen those things where, like, um, it's like a, like, um, like, 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 like
Step on it like you just scoop up like a little rocket thing up in the air. Mm. Oh, those are called I, stomp I rockets. Those are those awesome. Are those are when awesome. Them, it's fun when you bring them like camping sometimes. One time I brought them camping and one of them was like super far. Can I tell you the only time I've ever done a stomp rocket was when we were at Forest Hill. And I'm going to tell you what, Miss Richardson's legs are strong. Why I, oh yeah, baby. This girl went boosh and the thing went woo. It was awesome. Yeah, there's usually two things that you stomp on. It was awesome. All right. Moving atoms. Atoms are constantly moving. However, atoms move at different speeds within different states of matter. Atoms move more slowly when they are more densely packed. Atoms in solids are usually tightly packed and have less space to move around freely. This means that atoms in most solids move more slowly than atoms in most liquids. The atoms in gas usually move them the fastest, right? Since the atoms usually move more freely in liquids and gases, they can undergo a process called diffusion. Solids can diffuse as well, although it is a much longer process. Diffusion is the movement of particles from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. That's why when you spray perfume in a corner of a room, you will eventually smell it on the other side of the room. The atoms from the perfume diffuse through the air. Because of this diffusion, the perfume scent is spread. I have a diffuser in this room. Have you guys noticed? It's all the way over there, but people, people walking in can smell it. Now, the oil that I put in there is in a little bottle about this big. I only put about, yeah, that you can grab it. I only put about seven or eight drops of oil in the water. Thanks. This is the oil bottle that, I, that I've that been diffusing. It's called Thieves. I only put about seven or eight drops of oil in my little diffuser. Thank you. And, and and you can smell it the entire room. Now the first time, oh my hands smell good now. The first time I diffused ever in this building, I didn't even have a diffuser at my house when I first started diffusing here, was <clears throat> the classroom smelled like poop. And it was not this classroom, and I'm not even remotely <laughs> joking, the classroom smelled like poop. So I diffused an oil called purification. And the amazingness that purification is, is the classroom no longer smelled like poop. It smelled like lemon and citrusy type of smell. It's a real clean smell and I love it. Now, when it's winter time and people are getting temperatures and going home and thinking they're gonna puke and all that jazz, I usually do thieves because it helps fight against that kind of thing but but when we get into the summer months and you guys forget your deodorant and it's a, and it's a gym day and it's a gym day and this entire room smells like a sweaty gym oh it's gross then we'll probably start going back to purification. There is such a thing called deodorants. And before we get to the warmer months, which are swiftly coming upon us, and you know this room does not stay cool, you're going to want to assist your pits in de-stinking. There is such a thing as putting it on before you leave the house. And yes, you can always, Miss Richardson keeps one here for Miss Richardson in case I forget. Cause ain't nobody wanna smell Miss Richardson stinky. Just saying. You can always reapply. You can just trot your little rear end with your deodorant to the bathroom, reapply it. Put it back in your 
lacquer and everybody's nose will thank you for it because stinky scent will also diffuse in the classroom i'm just saying one person lets out gas it diffuses in the classroom somebody pukes it diffuses in the classroom that is all i'm saying i i gotta finish because i'm running out of time so that's moving atoms identification we can identify materials according to a variety of properties we've been talking about this scientists have determined several different measurements to help label materials some examples are temperature hardness that was one of the things you guys were measuring with was hardness Color, we, we talked about white. Length, uh, color and length. So we used white as color and length. Usually they are, these are used to measure solids like rocks and minerals. Um, however, temperature can be used to measure liquids as well. When geologists study rocks, they often use the Mo scale of mineral hardness. This scale allows us to characterize the scratch resistance of various minerals. Scratch means, can I scratch this rock with my fingernail? Can I scratch this rock with a diamond? Some rocks are soft enough you can actually scratch them with your fingernail. That'll give you an idea of, yep, sometimes you can rub it off on something, yep. Um, this allows us to characterize the scratch resistance of various minerals. A diamond is used, is described as hard because it is extremely difficult to scratch. Scientists can measure hardness with the Mohs scale and compare minerals to other minerals. Scientists always use various methods to group minerals together. That way, it's easier to study and compare them. That's another reason we differentiate between liquids, gases, solids, and plasmas. Um, all right, homework. Looks like this. Uh, let's see. How many homeworks to give you? All right, let's see. All right, let's do one and two. One and two is going to use matter. Every is everywhere. Number one says, we, what can be identified according to a variety of properties? What can be identified according to a variety of properties? I don't need a complete sentence. I just want as little as possible that will answer the question. Uh, what are four examples of properties? List me the four examples of properties. Use the article Adventure on a Hot Air Balloon to answer questions three and four. Adventure on a Hot Air Balloon. Um, the only thing Keith Rodriguez controls in his hot air balloon is altitude. How does he control the balloon's altitude? I just want to know how he does it. You do not need to use complete sentences. Number four. What property of propane does Rodriguez change when using change using the burner support your answer with evidence from the text so i'm going to call this one worth two points because you're going to give me evidence from the text Helium. Um, 
helium is lighter than regular air, so it's going to float because because he, helium is lighter. Um, your breath isn't as light as helium is. Um, the only way that your breath would float, essentially, in the thing is if you warmed it enough to make it lighter than air. Because your breath that you're putting in as is the has the same heaviness that the air has, it's not going to float. So because the the balloon traps the air in and the balloon has a weight too, it's not equal to the air that's around it. Does that make sense? Okay. Good question. Okay, say it one more time. What? I don't know, like, so, so, let's go back to this really quick. So, I have, remember we did this, and we said, okay, in a solid, you have 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? And they're all pretty close. Oops, sorry, you can't see. 12. So there's my solid, right? And then we talked about a liquid. And liquid still has 12. And some of them are kind of close. 4, maybe this one's 5, 6, 7, 8... 9, 10, 11, and 12. So they're still kind of close, um, which is why, like, when you pour a liquid, it goes out and down. Do you know what I'm saying? Because they're not like this. They're not, like, solid. So in a lot of ways, this has the flex of a liquid. Your hair would have the flexibility of a liquid. They're still solid. My guess is they look less like this and a little bit more atomized like this. A gas has the same 12, potentially, right? Same. So this solid weighs the same as this liquid, which is going to weigh the same as this gas. But this gas looks like this. Well, it's all spread around. Yeah, 10, 11, 12. And it's kind of like, so, so if we're talking kids, this is like high school students, right? Or college students. They sit in their seats, they're in rows, they're pretty close together. Or you guys pretty much right now. This is like third graders, right? Yeah, they get they're, they're in their spots, but they move a lot more. They do a lot more wiggling than college students. This is like a preschool or kindergarten room. You ever go in a preschool or kindergarten room? The kiddos are a little cuckoo crazy. Especially at playtime, right? They're like, zoom, zoom. Sometimes they have the zoomies like the doggies, right? So this is kind of what the molecules are doing. The molecules here... In a solid, think of an ice cube. You put an ice cube on your skin, you're like, you, or you get cold, you immediately pull your body in, right? And you're like, duh, 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 right? This is like a liquid. Oh gosh, it's kind of nice out. It's 60 or 70 degrees. It's Miss Richardson's happy place. And I feel pretty good. I'm drinking my water. I'm not, you know, this is like, Oh my, it's so gross out. I can hardly breathe. The air feels thick. It's hot. You want to be in your swimsuit in the pool or in your shorts and your tank tops because you're so hot. And so the stuff is zipping around really quick. 
and it's moving really quick so it gets hot right so a gas is so hot it's jumping so fast that it steams up and it comes out does that help okay I'm, 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 I'm thinking, I don't know that I know the answer to that, so I'm not going to hazard a guess. Um, my guess is, well, I'll, I will take a guess. My guess is because helium, um, like the properties of helium, because helium rises, um, I think it does something inside you because it, it, it acts different than air does is this making sense to you that's my guess but you'll have to look it up Let me think about it, okay? All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye.